Or in this case, when we're talking about a compromised or a corrupted leader, especially one that's very charismatic, that is manipulative, that draws you in, see, there can be soul ties created. And the enemy gets a hook to that. And it becomes this umbilical cord that just feeds. And I believe that that is uh, how a lot of these familiar spirits have been passing on. Hello, everyone. This is Wanda Alger, and today is Wednesday, January 3, 2024. Well, you know what? Since uh, posting my last three uh, videos and episodes, and especially my interviews with Andrew and Blaze, I have received more email and more messages about those episodes than anything else I've posted on my video channels or on my website. This story is getting a lot of attention, and I'm going to be continuing to address some things. And there's two reasons why. Uh, one is uh, the Lord continues to bring me uh, prophetic dreams. You know, back in 2021 and 2022, when I shared about this nation, about President Trump and uh, different things that were going on, it was because the Lord drew me there through dreams. He was trying to get my attention to say, hey, you need to look at this. You need to talk about this. And that's what he's been doing with this story. I shared a dream, uh, I think a number of posts ago that the Lord gave that really drew my attention. And it was a parable. You know, Jesus spoke in parables. Why? Because he wanted to teach the people lessons, principles. And that's what he's been doing with me, is he gives me a dream as a parable because he wants to speak to the body of Christ to learn something. Well, last week, my husband had another dream that I knew pertained to this specific storyline. And I'm going to share that with you. But before we can do that, uh, I need to lay a groundwork here uh, because we are talking about things that are affecting the whole body of Christ. And I want to read this scripture because this is the second reason why I feel like we need to talk about these things. Not because, again, we're trying to expose a man or a ministry at uh, the International House of Prayer in Kansas City. There's a, a principle here, and we can find it in 1 Corinthians 12, 21 to 26, when it talks about the body of Christ. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable, par more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And here's the line I want you to hear. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. You know, in our physical bodies, when there is a trauma or an injury to your physical body, our body is made up. God has created it such that all the other systems in the body are, are immediately put on alert and systems change to draw attention to that trauma or that injury to make sure that the body still functions, you know, the blood flow and everything. Well, this is how I feel that we need to be responding to uh, this kind of story when a part of the body is in trauma. You know, maybe you've never uh, been involved with the International House of Prayer. You don't know who Mike Bickle is. Maybe uh, you're not a part of the charismatic stream. You don't believe in the gifts of the spirit. But if you are a believer in Jesus, well, this is a part of the body that is going through trauma right now. And so for that reason, we need to pay attention as to how we can pray. How can we help those who are being affected by this. So this is not a matter of, you know, breaking news of gossip and uh, hearsay and opinion and uh, predicting what's going to happen. What my heart is, is to uncover, Lord, how can we as the body of Christ minister to this need so that we can find healing, not only in this situation, but as I've said before, to learn the lessons that God's teaching us. And it seems like the lessons that he's teaching us is he's drawing attention uh, to some roots, to some infected roots of the body of Christ. Uh, as exposures come, we find, you know, things are not as they appear. And he's pointing us to those things that brought us to this place. And so what I want to talk about is uh, compromised and cultish leaders. You know, this isn't really as much about the gifts. I'm going to get to that. 
We're talking about leadership, compromised leaders or corrupted leaders and how we are impacted by them. I want to talk about soul ties and familiar spirits, because these are things that are at work uh, in stories like this. And it's something that we're all affected by. So regardless of your take on what's happening there at IHOP KC, you will gain something from listening here to what I have to share. I've got a lot of notes um, because we, we've all been impacted and we need to understand how the enemy tries to infiltrate because this is a gradual thing. You know, no one decides they're going to be corrupted or compromised, <laughs> um, but it happens in very subtle ways when we're not healthy, when we don't keep Jesus first. So um, one of the things that I brought up in my past episodes, especially in my interviews with both Andrew and Blaze, was talking about not just a, a leader that, you know, was fallen, that was found to be, you know, immoral in sin, but we're talking about a culture, a culture within this particular ministry and within, unfortunately, numerous ministries uh, that is not healthy. And this was the thing that struck me as uh, a number of you emailed me and it really was an answer to prayer. And I, I want you to hear this. I prayed, you know, even after posting these videos, Lord, I, I want firsthand information here. If you want me to cover this, if you want me to talk about it, I don't want to just go by what I read online. I, I want to hear from people who are there, people who know these people, people on the ground. Well, that's exactly what's happened within the last five days. I have been contacted by numerous people, both uh, through email and through trading phone numbers. And I have been hearing stories. I have been getting testimonies. I have heard from people who were there even 40 years ago during the Kansas City Prophets, Metro Christian Fellowship, IHOP. And it's been very enlightening. And all I can say is that it was very confirming of many of the things that we've been sharing in recognizing the patterns that what started out good it got compromised. And there were some very unhealthy practices uh, that were seen. Um, at the same time, I do need to say, I heard from numerous people who shared testimonies of the impact that that particular ministry had on them, which I'm not surprised at, because this is a thing that we're learning is that there is both good and bad in these situations. God's gifts are in operation and people do get blessed. There is an anointing there. I mean, people's lives have been changed because of this particular ministry. God has been using it. I mean, it shows his mercy that he will use people, you know, weakened individuals like you and I to work through, to speak through because he loves people. And so I was really encouraged, you know, to hear the good. Um, but we have to recognize, okay, what is this culture? And we talked about the religious spirit infiltrating things. And, you know, I, online, depending upon where you're at, especially if you're on X or Twitter, there's quite a bit of conversation there, especially uh, from uh, millennials and, and those maybe in their 20s and 30s. And the, the term cult is thrown around quite a bit. And personally, I, I think that's a, um, maybe a bit extreme. And yet, if you look at the definition of cults, there's some things to, to learn by uh, because cults uh, will claim to have some kind of special revelation. Um, and... and let me be clear, I am not calling IHOP a cult by no means. But if we look at some of the unhealthy things that often happen within ministries that end up going extreme, that end up falling away, uh, that can even go into heresy, oftentimes these are patterns that you're going to see is that ministry or that minister will claim to have a special revelation, something unique that nobody else has but they focus primarily on that. It becomes very narrow. And that's a danger sign right there, that they're not you know, looking at the whole picture. And this was something that even the emails uh, indicated. Some shared that uh, you know, because of the messaging within this particular ministry, it was very narrow. It was not holistic at all in terms of even healthy relationships or marriage or family, which should be you know, a little bit of a red flag. Uh, now, obviously, ministries will have their particular focus, but here again, it's a continuum. When you get to that point where the message that you have is so narrow, see, that's when the religious spirit sneaks in. Oftentimes, again, within a, a, a cultish 
atmosphere, there's a lot of pressure upon anyone that's a part of it to conform to that message, to conform to whatever that culture dictates they believe uh, is, you know, right in, in their eyes. Again, that's a continuum. Where does it shift? That it begins controlling, that it's not giving life anymore. It's actually sucking the life out of you. That should be a red flag. And oftentimes, you know, within a compromised or cultish um, atmosphere, there's usually a charismatic figurehead that's kind of leading the charge that uh, people are drawn to. And the fact is, you know, as these ministries are uh, brought into the light and some of these well-known ministers uh, are being exposed, I mean, the fact is you're not going to build a huge ministry if you don't have something to offer. You know, there, there's going to be something that's good within it that that's going to draw people. Um, but there again, depending upon how that gift is used, it can all center around that individual. And here's where I want to I want to challenge uh, another uh, argument uh, or accusation that's been thrown around is that because this ministry in particular it has, it has association with prophets. There are those who don't believe in the gifts of the spirit. They don't believe in apostles and prophets. So now this is a perfect opportunity to say, well, see, there you have it. Those who are claiming to be prophets and apostles, look at how bad that is. You got to do away with prophets and apostles. And it's almost like, hmm, well, there's guns that are used for mass shootings. Therefore, you need to take away all guns. Not the gun that's the problem. It's the person. So it, it's not the gift. We're talking about a compromised individual that happens to be operating in a gift. Actually, the Holy Spirit showed me this yesterday. If you're looking at a pattern here, and if you want to pick on prophets and apostles, actually, if you study your church history, go back to the 70s. There were a lot of teachers that were very forefront in the body of Christ. And the teaching gift was very prominent. This is where the word of faith teaching uh, emerged, and even the prosperity teaching Um and another teacher that I thought of was Bill Gothard. Maybe you're familiar with him. He was really big uh, during that time because he had all these conferences that taught on family, on marriage. And I mean, it was a in-depth teaching that impacted a lot of people. He was very famous for a long time until he went totally off the rails. He got so extreme. It was so unhealthy. And interestingly enough, Bill Gothard was never married. He never had his own family, and yet he was the expert, Okay. Well, he was a teacher. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't an apostle. He was a teacher. So because we see the extreme of that, well, then you should throw away all teachers. Or if you consider in the 80s, the shepherding movement, and that too was associated even with Mike Bickle. He was involved in that a little bit. Um, here was the pastoring gift, you know, leaders wanting to prove we need oversight. We need care. We need discipling. And, you know, they, they created this whole system around shepherding. But again, it got so extreme and off the rails that uh, some of the leaders of it ended up denouncing it in the end. Well, OK, you're going to do away with all shepherds. Well, hopefully you're getting my point. It's the problem is not being a prophet or being an apostle. It's that individual that's been compromised and corrupted. It's not the gift that's corrupted, it's the individual, okay? So I know not everyone's gonna like that because I see a lot of um, conversation still going about the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation, which I've already posted a whole video about that if you wanna watch it, what it is. And the argument, again, is those in the body of Christ that don't believe that apostles and prophets are valid for today. And my point has always been that they cite all the bad examples. And to me, that's not a biblical argument. <laughs> um, I know many who are walking in those gifts in a very healthy way that are bearing a lot of fruit, but that's for another time. Okay, so what we want to look at is uh, digging a little deeper. Again, we're going to the roots here. And I wanna, I wanna talk about soul ties and familiar spirits. Uh, and part of the reason I'm doing this is I wanna see people get free. How do we get there? And then how do we get free? Because if you watched uh, the episode where I shared my first dream, it was like I was inside this house. And, you know, when I first put that out, I, I didn't want to claim this is about, you know, IHOP. But now I, since more has come out and I've heard people's stories, especially those who are there now or who were recently there, I'm, 
I'm realizing, no, that's exactly what that was. And so um, I felt like the Lord was saying, listen, there are people caught in systems like this, not only in a ministry, um, it can even be in an organization, it can be in a family where we are in a family type atmosphere, but there is dysfunctional leadership. It's not healthy. And we can still honor one another. We can still see the good that God is doing, but we don't have to get tied into or stuck with the unhealthy stuff. Okay. And that is where I want to talk about familiar spirits and soul ties. You know, if you have done any deep dives into uh, the history of IHOP, uh, even going back to the Kansas City Prophets, maybe you're aware that in 1990, there was a huge controversy started by a pastor named Ernie Gruen, who publicly in January of 1990 uh, presented a sermon that uh, was very condemning of uh, Metro Christian Fellowship at that time and the Prophets. I mean, it went worldwide, global. It ended up being a 233-page document of everything that was wrong there. And one of the things that he cited was he felt they were operating by familiar spirits. And when I first saw that, it caught my attention. And I thought, wow, I think there's something there. Well, what is a familiar spirit? Okay, and this is not meant to be an in-depth teaching about familiar spirits, but I will draw your attention. In the Old Testament, it's actually that term familiar spirit is used nine times in the King James Version. Now, I know we've got a lot of translations today, uh, but in the King James Version, it is used. And basically, it's, it's referring to demons, okay, demonic spirits. Leviticus 19.31, uh, is, regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 26. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. <laughs> Basically, these, these references in the Old Testament, when it's talking about consulting familiar spirits, it's consulting with the dead. It's like necromancy. In 1 Samuel 28.3, this is what King Saul did. When he was dissatisfied because he didn't think that God was answering his prayers and giving him the information he wanted, even though he had outlawed uh, wizards and witches and mediums, he himself went to a medium, a witch, uh, and because he wanted to seek out the spirit of Samuel. Well, that was a familiar spirit. So he opened the door to that, and the result was judgment that soon took the life of Saul and his sons. And so there's numerous references to this. Familiar spirits, uh, they're demonic counterfeits, uh, and they're not of the Lord. And what I have found about familiar spirits is they can even be passed through families. That's why they're familiar. They can be passed through a bloodline. If a grandparent or anyone in the family line has ended up tapping into that, then that becomes an open door. And it can affect the bloodline and even pass through without even knowing it. Uh, even by association, there's if there's familiar spirits at work within an individual, uh, depending upon how close you get to that individual, what you draw from them, how you open your spirit to them, it can become an open door for the enemy then to come. Now, there is another reference to familiar uh, and this was when I was studying this years ago and praying into it myself. I was looking for anything scripture, you know, that talked about familiar. And I did find this in Psalm 55, 12, 14, where David talks about his familiar friend who was taunting him. It says, and this is Psalm 55, 12, for it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolent with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together. Within God's house, we walked in the throng. And what I felt like the, the insight the Lord was giving me through there is that a familiar spirit will feel like a friend. A familiar spirit will, will feel comfortable because it's family. And 
you know, in this reference, David is, is saying, I thought we were friends, but now you're coming against me. Now you're an enemy. And so this is something we don't talk about much in the church, because I think it is hard uh, to understand how that can affect us, because uh, obviously the Old Testament references, it's actually seeking out the occult. Well, the fact is, most believers, we're not going to do that. We know that's wrong, okay? But the unfortunate thing is that the enemy will look for any loophole to, to get in. And here's where I wanted to mention, and, and this is might get a little dicey here, but again, I've been going down to the roots. And part of the emails that I've received and some of the people I've talked to uh, knew Paul Cain, who was a part of the Kansas City Prophets. He was the senior prophet in that group. He was very influential in Metro Christian Fellowship and then eventually even in IHOP. He was considered to be a spiritual father of many of the prophets. Unfortunately, if you study Paul Cain's life, uh, you find some very unhealthy things. Now, those, and I've talked with numerous people in this last week who knew him, who spoke with him, who was a part of his ministry and his life. So what I'm sharing is not just stuff I've found online. I, and I've heard enough that, um, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid to, to say it. Uh, it appears that he was actually violated himself when he was a young boy. But he was known to be an alcoholic and a homosexual. And though through the years, uh, there were seasons where he was supposedly restored, those who were closest to the situation will attest to the unfortunate reality that he never really was. And many times he didn't want it. And what I have perceived about him is, and this is my opinion here through, through what I have studied, and, and there's a point to why I'm saying this, of, of how these things can pass on, is that I have no problem believing that Paul really loved the Lord and it, he just had a very sad life, that God gifted him. He had a true gift of the Lord, but he was a very unhealthy individual and he did not have discernment. He did not have good discernment. Something that confirmed that to me, he, and, and here's where the, I believe the door really was opened. There was a period of 25 years in his life where he kind of disappeared and it's known, uh, and it's these, this is all public uh, open source. You can find this information yourself. For a period of time, he worked for the CIA. He worked uh, with the military on the Stargate project as a remote viewer. What is that? It's basically uh, spiritually uh, using you know psychic gifts to go spy, um, to remotely view and go find out things. And so the military was using his God-given gift for witchcraft. Now, you know, you have to ask, did he even know what he was doing? Why did he do that? Well, if you find uh, more stories, he was actually uh, a personal um, consultant to President Bill Clinton, to numerous presidents. He was known to be a prophet among presidents, he even talked to Saddam Hussein. And... Upon meeting Bill Clinton, it is said that that Paul Cain uh, said he was struck by the sincere love for the Lord that Bill Clinton had. Now, when I read that, I'm, I'm like, oh, my. I, and I know that he even prophesied at one time that he thought Bill Clinton was going to lead a world revival. OK, so, you know, bless his heart. <laughs> um, he did not have very good discernment. And so I say these things because, you know, you can't just demonize someone and say because so-and-so was involved in something or they were associated with someone, therefore, they were intentionally, you know, they're, they're a, a warlock. You know, they, they were always on the dark side and he was always a, a deceptive person. I don't know. I, I see someone that I, I believe probably could be a, a good person at heart, but he caught, he got caught up in a system that he had no clue what it, you know, what he was opening up. And, and, you know, another thought, and this is, you know, just hang with me here. Cause I, I think through how, how in the world could someone fall into this? Okay. And, and become corrupted. Okay. You think about 
any one uh, of these prophets who were known to have these tremendous gifts, especially word of knowledge. I mean, that's supernatural intelligence, right? Someone who would have a strong gift like that. I could only imagine that person feeling like, you know, I've got direct access to God. I mean, he's talking to me all the time. Seems like it would be very easy for that person to just begin to assume, to presume a certain level of favor with God, like nothing can touch me. And they don't keep their eyes open and they don't realize how they are giving the enemy access because they just assume, you know, God's talking to me all the time. He'll show me what's wrong. You know, that, that could happen. It's a possibility. Okay. Because obviously when you let your guard down, this is where the enemy swoops in. Well, if you, if you look at that possibility within someone like a Paul Cain, who had powerful gifts, and he was known to be walking in these sins, and he opened the door to the enemy, there would be familiar spirits operating in him. Then take that the next step to consider how many people wanted Paul Cain to prophesy to them, to lay hands on them, to receive his mantle, his gift. Oh, see, there's, there's so many ways that the enemy will take advantage of. You know, 1 Timothy 5.22, it says, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Now, and I, don't, I, I could go down a rabbit trail here because I'm not suggesting, I, I believe in the laying on of hands. I believe in impartation. It's very powerful. That's why Timothy is exhorting, be careful. But I just see how many people followed Paul Cain and received from him. And, and even in later years, and believe me, and Andrew, he testified he met Paul Cain near the end of his life and, and received a word from him. And to me, again, I believe there was a good part of Paul Cain in his heart that he really loved God. He loved people. He was just a sick individual. If we don't guard our hearts, um, the enemy will take advantage. Okay. And I know just for me, uh, it, when I get in situations where there's a, a prominent minister, be it a prophet or an apostle or a teacher, and, and they make themselves available to pray for people, I'm just very aware. And I, and I just consciously, in my heart, you know, I say, Lord, you are guarding my heart. And I trust you uh, that you will not allow anything in me that, that you don't want. Because the principle that I use, and I do need to say this, in terms of laying out of hands and impartation, whenever I've received prayer from someone who's laying out of hands, they're just the conduit. I, I'm not receiving from that person. In my mind, I'm not, I'm not looking to get something from that person. They're simply a conduit. If I receive something or even prayer from someone, I, I am getting it directly from the Holy Spirit, from God the Father. And I simply know that he's working through that individual. And so that's what I set my faith on. That's where I set my heart and my spirit. Lord, I'm receiving from you. You just go through this vessel. I don't want anything of their flesh. I'm just receiving from you. And God's always honored that. And, he, and I have received blessing and fruit from that. But if you're not aware of that, if you're not conscious, and you just let anybody lay hands on you, the enemy will use that. It's an open door. And, you know, it doesn't affect everybody the same way. And I realize I'm probably opening up, you know, issues that you'll have questions about. And that's okay. Feel free to, to put your questions in the comments. But these are all of the, all different aspects that we need to understand if when we're trying to free ourselves from these strongholds. And if we want to have healthy practices within churches and ministries so that these generational things, these ongoing strongholds don't continue, okay? Because God wants you to be free. And whether or not, again, you don't have any uh, you know, involvement with this particular ministry, it could be even in your own family or in your own church. When, you know, if you sense these things, don't demonize the person. Recognize that the enemy is just looking for an inroad, you know, to, to bind you up, right? So, you know, if there is a familiar spirit, something that seems um, it's a roadblock because a familiar spirit will get you stuck in place. It'll blind you uh, to hearing even 
what God is doing and, and hearing God's voice, it's very simple to get free. You just acknowledge it and you renounce it. And, you know, when, when I have had to pray through that, I've asked the Lord, you know, name it, show me exactly where. And then I just stand. I said, I don't want that. I, I renounce that in Jesus name and whatever that thing, you know, I, I thought I was getting, no, I don't want it. <laughs> Lord, take it off. I mean, it bottom line is it, it's as simple as that. It's simply recognizing that. Now this has to do then with understanding soul ties. Because soul ties is also something that the enemy uses to bind us and we get stuck and we can't get free. And this is something that you maybe have experienced personally uh, within family, among friends. This can happen between uh, you and a parent. It can happen between you and a child, between you and a leader, a counselor, a public figure. Soul ties, and, and I reference this in my interview with Andrew, and I do have a PDF document, I'll put the link below, uh, that goes into a lot of detail, and the PDF is called Leaving and Cleaving, and I explain it in the context of my relationship with my dad, because that's when I really learned it. Uh, you know, psychologists will call it codependency, and there certainly is uh, aspects of codependency that... And codependency, you're probably going to see more tangible results when you're codependent, you're, you're dependent on someone, uh, you know, in an unhealthy way. Well, soul ties is, is a spiritual counterpart to that. And um, in my own relationship with my dad, that's where I really learned about the power of an unhealthy soul tie. And so in that document, I define it. It's a cleaving together. It's a relationship where two souls are joined or knitted together first emotionally and then sometimes sexually. It is a joining of hearts and wills where the two people are bound together in kinship or affection. Now there can be good soul ties and bad soul ties. One example of a, of a good soul tie, and again, that this particular term you're not gonna find in scripture, uh, but here's an example in 1 Samuel 18 2, when it talks about the relationship between David and Jonathan. It says that Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. It, it describes this, this love between two brothers uh, who loved God. And it, it was that bond was very significant, but it, it did not violate or conflict with their covenant with God, because that's what an unhealthy soul tie does. Uh, their love for the Lord was first, and it, it did bring great blessing then to both, uh, to both of them. And so that's, you know, an example of a, of a healthy soul tie. Obviously, we have soul ties with family members, with parents, with children, um, that, that's good and meaningful when kept in the right order. But there is another example in Scripture, in Genesis 44, that alludes to this, an unhealthy soul tie. And this is the story of Jacob and his son Benjamin. And there's a statement made, and this is when the older brother Judah is talking to Joseph in Egypt. Um, Joseph wants Benjamin, their younger brother, to stay while they go back and talk to, to the father. Well, Judah, he makes this statement in Genesis 44, 30 that says, if the boy is not with us when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, he sees that the boy isn't there, he will die. Okay, so what is he describing? He's describing a father who has a huge soul wound. Of course, Jacob didn't. He thought that Joseph was dead. And so ever since that time, he's so wounded. Now he's got, he's only got one younger son, Benjamin. And so he's clinging to him. His life is bound up to him. And the thought that something's going to happen, it's going to kill him. That's that's not a healthy soul tie, okay? It, it sh instead of, you know, resting and trusting in God's, you know, protection, um, he walked in fear and anxiety. So that indicates now there's an unhealthy, there's a pull there. And this is what soul ties do, is that they cause us to be so concerned about what another person is thinking, how they feel about us, that we become more concerned about them than we do what God says, what God thinks about us. Now, this document, it goes into a lot more detail of what that looks like, the characteristics, if you feel like you may have an unhealthy soul tie with someone and how to break that because we can. But 
the reason I bring this up is that in a ministry setting, you can actually have a soul tie with a ministry, with an organization, with a church. And it happens when you are needing something in your soul. There is a hole somewhere. There is a void and you need something and you're looking for it. And then you find it within a person and they begin to feed that. And you're so desperate for it and you want it. And then, then you begin to depend upon it. Okay. And that's where it starts getting unhealthy because it, it's, it's feeding your soul and you're not letting the Lord be your primary source. And that's where it gets unhealthy. And the reason that it's dangerous is not only are you not putting the Lord first, when there is a soul tie in the spirit, it's like an umbilical cord because you're, you're drawing life from there. It's an umbilical cord. The enemy uses that as an open door. And so if that person is bound by a familiar spirit, if that person is bound by some kind of stronghold in their life, guess what? There's an open door now for those same spirits to impact you. That's what happened with my relationship with my dad. I began to experience things. It's like, where is this coming from? Why am I feeling this way? And I realized it's because I had this unhealthy soul tie with my dad that went way back, you know, as a little girl, I wanted my daddy's approval and I never got it. And the Lord had to heal that. And I, I, and I only recognized it when I was older because it had become an open door. And then all of a sudden I was getting all of my dad's rejection and condemnation and guilt. And it was like, I don't want that. And I had to, I had to cut that umbilical cord, cut that soul tie, that dependency. And, and I had to ask forgiveness, you know, from the Lord for, for drawing from that and, and purpose. Lord, I want to draw from you. Okay. So in a ministry setting, it's, it's very similar to that. Or in this case, when we're talking about a compromised or a corrupted leader, especially one that's very charismatic, that is manipulative, that draws you in, see, there can be soul ties created. And the enemy gets a hook to that. And it becomes this umbilical cord that just feeds. And I believe that that is uh, how a lot of these familiar spirits have been passing on. And oftentimes we don't recognize it, or you rarely do. And like I said, it doesn't affect everybody the same way. Um, but it will show up. And when it does, again, the reason I'm sharing this is I want you to be free of it. I want you to recognize what it is and to know that you have authority over that. And it's simply a matter of renouncing that soul tie, renouncing that dependency or that looking to that person or that ministry or that leader to give you something. And you have to surrender it and say, no, I'm not going to look to that person, you know, for whatever it is in my life that I'm lacking. I'm going to look to the Lord. You know, bottom line is the Lord is doing a deep sanctifying work within this ministry and within the body of Christ. There are some unhealthy things, unhealthy relationships. There's some soul wounds that many people have had that we need to allow the Lord to heal. There have been familiar spirits masquerading, especially within the charismatic movement in the gifts of the spirit. But the problem is not the gifts of the spirit. Problem is how we have unknowingly many times opened these doors because we get so transfixed by a person's gift. We get so transfixed by someone's charisma or we have such a need in our own life to feel like we want what they have. It becomes an open door. You know, bottom line is we, we need to draw from the Lord first and foremost. That's when it's healthy. We're in covenant with him. And when we're in right relationship with him, then, then we can receive freely what someone has. We're not dependent upon it. It's not going to make or break us. We can have an objectivity where we can actually measure it rightly. And we're not going to be sucked in to something that, that we're just going to believe something just because well, it came from them. No. We need to have our eyes wide open. And we need to have our hearts and our soul area, especially healthy and directly connected to the Lord. So as I said, I, I'm going to put links and I'm going to conclude this part. This is a two-parter, okay? This is the introduction. But I, I wanted you to understand the dynamics, okay, of these strongholds and how they function, how they can impact anybody, 
and how to get free, I'm going to put links below on my website, WandaAldrew.me. I've showed you, I put out a new welcome video on my YouTube channel. I show you how to go on my website and access uh, a lot of information. It's free, PDF downloads, prayer guides that will help you walk through this. There's also numerous videos. And if you do go on my website and especially go to the Inner Healing Deliverance uh, resource tab, everything is listed there. Articles I've written, PDFs, videos that I've done on this, teachings that I've done um, to really give you handles on this. But in part two, I'm going to share this prophetic dream that the Lord gave my husband last week. And it was specifically, specifically related to this ministry, to IHOP KC. And it revealed, again, it was a parable. The Lord is showing us some things. He's wanting to teach us some things. And given now the context that you have, I think you're going to understand that. And so we're going to unpack that. And I'm hoping that it's going to really encourage you. Because again, we as the body, there, there are things that are happening within the body of Christ. We all need to come together and minister to the, to the parts of the body that are weak right now, to the parts of the body that are going through crisis. We need to pray for them. We need to pray through this, learn together, and come out the other side, praising God for what he's doing in the midst of it, okay? So with that, I'll look forward to seeing you in part two.